Welcome to the pre-lecture for Industrial Ecology, week four, fall 2018. I'm Josh Wisco. There will be a pop quiz. Here's your hint. I'm not saying any more right now. Quick overview of the week. A few notes here, more in class. Urban mobility, once again, just like last week. This week's focus is transportation as a service, TAS. Should sound a little bit like SaaS, software as a service. I think most of you are familiar with that. Uh, the focus will be this really interesting think piece by a Bay Area think tank, Rethink X. Rethinking Transportation 2020 to 2030. Boy, I just said think many times there. Uh, it's really interesting and will open up a lot of issues. It will be the overwhelming focus in the reading this week. It's most of the reading you have. A couple of other notes. I'm going to talk about Waymo in Arizona, Bridge in Australia. It's an example of microtransit. Uh, just to give you a little more color uh, around the edges of the Rethink X piece. Um, and by Wednesday, we'll be talking about Urbanism Next Framework for thinking about autonomous vehicles broadly. Uh, passengers, freight, uh, and the implications for cities. Uh, just as a note, the, the end of car ownership, this piece in the Wall Street Journal, is really great uh, if you have time to look at it, but it's not an assigned reading. The big challenge with this rethinking transportation piece is that I want you to try to wrestle with how to use this analysis even if you don't believe it all. It will paint a, what will strike many of you as a bit of a caricature, kind of an extreme version of how things might turn out. Uh, but I encourage you not to just throw it all away if any one piece of it seems wrong. So we will, we'll talk more about that in class. So a little bit of setup, uh, the term of the week and uh, these, this, these summary points, I'll leave this in here for reference. I really wanna talk about these questions. Let me just hit on one, two, and five very quickly. First, are there individual elements of the financial and technical modeling that you question? You do not have to be an expert in this area. I am just looking for you to you know, have a gut check on these different pieces. There are a lot of assumptions piled on top of each other to get the outcomes that these authors predict. Uh, so I want you to be able to pick away at that a little bit. Uh, in particular, number two, will consumer culture respond to market forces as quickly as they project? And what precedent do you see uh, that suggests this level of adoption, really rapid adoption of a new technology and new technology-enabled transportation mode um, what could actually happen so quickly? So we'll talk a little bit about uh, adoption in class and rates of adoption. And number five, finally, I'll want you, you know, in the spirit of figuring out how to, how to use this, wrestling with how to use some piece of this analysis, even if you don't believe it all, Let's say this same change takes place, but more slowly. It takes place over two decades instead of one, um, or happens only to half the degree that's predicted. Uh, you know, what stays the same? What changes? I want you to think about that, because that's another way of engaging these results, even if you don't think they'll play out exactly as predicted. So I'm going to walk through uh, certain elements of the summary here. I have a couple of slides on this, and then we'll talk about it more in class. I want to make sure you under, understand it and are comfortable with it. Uh, massive and rapid deployment of electric autonomous fleet vehicles run by platforms such as Uber or Lyft. That's the, the punchline. Uh, transportation as a service becomes, as a result, the dominant form, I think maybe a dominant form, maybe the dominant form of urban mobility. Certainly if it is the 95% or more of vehicle miles uh, that they predict, that sounds dominant. Uh, in parallel, a decline in the ownership and use of individually owned internal combustion engine vehicles. You think back to that three revolutions piece we saw in week one, uh, there are two different pieces there, individually owned and internal combustion engine. We'll break those up as we go. And then uh, the corollary here is major disruption to incumbent industries. Uh, so a variety of sectors will shrink uh, or collapse even, and we'll want to talk about that. Uh, and at the same time as that, huge net economic benefit and a uh, big plus for the environment as well. So let's talk a little bit about the structure of this analysis and talk about what's inside the boundaries. What do they take into account? There are some technological assumptions that are laid out very explicitly, uh, a, a simple but compelling financial analysis that stems from those assumptions. 
uh, adoption rates that stem from the financial analysis, and then these industry-wide and economy-wide implications uh, that you get from all of this stuff playing out so quickly and deeply. So that's what's inside the boundary. Outside the boundary, there's some other things we might care about. First and foremost, urban form. How does this change cities, if it plays out like this at all? Uh, the piece is largely silent on those details, so we'll want to dig into that a bit. Uh, equity and access. We've already alluded in our discussions of other transportation modes to different people having different needs and different modes uh, addressing different populations uh, to one degree or another. We'll want to continue that conversation here. And then uh, what about other modes? This analysis is really car-centric. It's kind of about uh, future crazy new electric Uber cars versus old-fashioned uh, gasoline-burning cars. I think there are other modes, so let's talk about that a bit. Let's go through a few of the main elements in the analysis. Uh, first, detailed conclusion number one, rapid adoption. Uh, note how this is driven overwhelmingly by price. You know, the authors of this piece assert a dramatic drop in the cost per mile of using these autonomous electric lifts and Ubers. And that's really what drives this rapid adoption. So because the whole analysis really depends on the speed of adoption, we'll want to uh, spend some time on that. Uh, second, uh, a really precipitous decline in individually owned uh, regular cars, also known as internal combustion engine vehicles. Again, think about those two pieces. This is different. Uh, we have a change in ownership, people going from individually owned vehicles to using fleet vehicles, and then we have the advantages uh, posed by electric vehicles. Um, but the combination of those things will have these important economy-wide ripple effects that we'll talk about. Third, and this is, I think, maybe the most interesting piece of the analysis, these stranded vehicles. And this is, uh, this is drawing on this concept of stranded assets. I'll read this definition. Long-lived capital that unexpectedly loses its value during its originally planned useful life. That's important, and really the big word there is unexpectedly, because you expect everything to depreciate. Everything wears out. Everything decreases in value over time. A house, a car, uh, you know, your, your phone... Uh, a piece of uh, physical plant or equipment in manufacturing, all that you know loses value over time. The problem is when uh, it unexpectedly loses value way inside the amount of time that you thought it was going to last and still be valuable as an asset. Uh, so we'll we'll really dig into this. I think this is, as I said, one of the most interesting and creative pieces of the analysis, and we'll try to understand how that's happening. And, uh, there'll be a little parallel here with Netflix, but I'll say more about that in class. Uh, so conclusion number four, 50% uh, increase in passenger miles. Because transportation suddenly becomes so inexpensive and convenient, a lot more people are going to be traveling. But again, this must have implications for urban form. None of that is really uh, dealt with in the paper. So let's talk about that in class as well. And last here, huge environmental benefit. Uh, honestly, this really just overlaps with the, the piece on electrification in the Three Revolutions article from earlier in the quarter. But I want to make sure we don't miss it because uh, this isn't central to the mechanics of the paper. It's really just uh, almost a, a side effect of this technology-driven transition. Uh, but we'll want, to, we'll want to keep it in mind. It's a, it's a big deal and might be a reason to take this scenario particularly seriously. As we wrestle with urban form, we'll have a little sidebar conversation in class about this, uh, this picture. Uh, there have been a few versions of this over the last couple of decades, and what you see here is a presentation of the use of urban space by different transportation modes. Uh, on the left, you see 50 or 60 people and the amount of space they take up on a bus. Uh, 50 or 60 people there in the middle and the amount of space they take up on bicycles. And then on the right, same number of people, but in individual, uh, in single occupancy vehicles. So pretty dramatic implications for urban space, uh, whether it's roadway or parking. Uh, but 
it's an interesting place to start, and we'll want to we'll want to talk about this uh, in class as well, mainly on Wednesday. But I want you to see this so we can chat about it on Monday. We'll talk about a couple of other sidebars, things that have shown up in the optional readings or in slides in class. Uh, in Denver, developer is trying to make very modular parking, so it doesn't have to stay parking forever. And then also uh, Oslo's uh, upcoming ban on vehicles from the city center. Uh, obviously, examples of changes in the use of urban space as a result of different transportation futures. Rethink X has done a great job summing up its report in a handful of really compelling graphs. I will want you to be able to explain each one of these. I'm going to give you a little bit of a preview here, but of course, most of this is going to be about uh, what's going on in uh, what, what we do in class. Uh, we won't be able to go through all of them right now. First, uh, figure five, the speed of transportation as a service adoption. A few things to walk through. Uh, I want to be clear, this doesn't say everything. It says a very particular thing, and I will want you to know what it's saying and what it's not saying. Specifically, note the distinction between miles and vehicles. That vertical axis is passenger miles, and note the composition, composition of those changing over time. So this will be one of the graphs we'll spend some time on in class, perhaps in an activity. Uh, next, figure eight, personal vehicle fleet size and composition over the period covered in the study. And notice the vertical axis here is not miles, but vehicles, right? So this is important. Uh, and the two graphs together, uh, the previous one, figure five, and this one, figure eight, you know, together really tell most of the story. Uh, we'll dig into another one here in a moment, but this is a lot of it. Um, I want you to look at particular thresholds or years in here and really try to understand them. So what is happening between 2022 and 2023? Take a look at that and see what you, what you see happening there. Uh, and then why are there all of a sudden these so-called stranded individually owned vehicles by 2024? How is that possible? Note that showing up on the graph. And then between 2029 and 2030, we see the number of stranded vehicles actually declining. It's not called out numerically, but you can look at the height of those bars and it's pretty clear that it's going down. Why? What is happening there? I want you to think hard about that. And finally, to what extent does this analysis change if the pace of TAS adoption is only half as fast? Uh, in class, we'll try to draw some of our own graphs and fiddle around with this a little bit. You could certainly do a really cool one in Excel. Uh, but the point is to think about how much of this is dependent on the speed at which it is happening. We'll wrestle with that more in class. Next, I'll want you to spend some time with figure seven. Uh, see how this is a, a change in the car value chain uh, between 2015 and 2030, the bookends of this study. This is really quite profound. If you think of it in the following way, I think you'll really appreciate this graph. The move from a big bubble to a small bubble means a, a dramatic shrinking of that sector. Well, shrinking, but in many of these cases, truly dramatic. Uh, some of these sectors are, are shrinking in size by 80% or 90%, and we'll want to understand why that is. And uh, I want you to speculate about what that will mean for different parts of the economy. And we have some pieces that are growing here as well, and we'll talk about those too. But as you speculate, here are a few avenues of speculation. What will the remaining companies in a severely shrunken market look like? Uh, how will they, as incumbent industries, push back? How will they respond to these changes? Uh, what, individuals, what will individuals employed in these sectors do uh, if these are big shifts in employment? And then how usable are the assets that result? I think this is particularly interesting because uh, remember, we're talking, we talked about stranded assets at the level of individually owned vehicles, uh, but now we may have it uh, in, the, in the private sector in, in industries as well. So that'll be quite, uh, quite a big deal. Uh, I will go through some of your comments, of course, in class. Um, from your reflections, they have been great. 
And then by Wednesday, we will spend a little bit of time with uh, the Urbanism Next framework for looking at uh, not just automation and transportation, but the implications of, of uh, autonomous vehicles uh, throughout uh, different aspects of cities. Uh, we'll definitely look at that transportation piece, but we will look at all these other aspects of urban form and urban economies to understand uh, not just the disruption in a negative sense, but the opportunities here. Uh, this should be uh, a lot of fun. Uh, so make sure you've read all of these little boxes. There's only not even a couple of dozen of them. Not too much to, uh, too much to worry about there. But make sure you've done those, uh, looked at those by Wednesday. That is the pre-lecture for week four. I will see you in class. Thanks.